Amidst the constant warfare of the ogres, one battle stands out, a defining moment where a conglomerate of tribes was forged into a mighty nation whose tread shakes the world. The Battle of the Fire Mouth not only galvanized the ogre kingdoms, but also roused their dormant volcano god. It began with a great black orc invasion. Since the days when they first escaped the enslavement of the Chaos Dwarfs, many black orcs have settled in the Mountains of Morn. Since that ancient time, ogres and black orcs have fought many battles. But for their brawn, the ogres can never fully extradite the orcs from their midst. And so it has gone, back and forth, for over two thousand years. Both sides grown to respect their foe's fighting prowess. Urk Ironskull rose quickly to become the greatest Black Orc war boss of the Mountains of Morn. Under his rule, the Black Orcs expanded further than ever, pushing far out from their stronghold of Mount Black Fang. Urk understood how to defeat ogres, and he destroyed many tribes. As Urk Iron Skull's onslaught gained momentum, it swelled into a war, an invasion that attracted greenskins from all over, including many wolf riders from the tribes of the Darklands, and night goblins from Mount Greyhag. With each new battle, Urk's legions grew, and the disjointed ogres could not hope to stand against the overwhelming greenskin attacks. At the time, Grisus Goldtooth had only recently claimed the title of Overtyrant, the ruler of all the ogre tribes. While he dominated the kingdoms nearest to his own, more distant tribes, particularly those of the north, were not yet convinced of Grisus' right to rule. Grisus had performed feats of strength that carried his name across the ogre kingdoms, slaying the great ice drake, Jaugral, earning him the name Drake Crush, breaking open the stone gates of a dwarf mine, hence the moniker Gate Crasher, and eating an entire herd of Gruntalope, earning indigestion as it was simply too many hooves in one go, but he had never fully gathered the ogres under his command. When Grisus heard of Urk Skull's army, he knew it was the challenge that he had been seeking. If he could crush the Black Orc invasion, none could fail to recognize his greatness or dispute his title. The voluminous Overtyrant traveled to many valleys to gather support. Under his demand, the ogre tribes all along the Ivory Road, and as far south as Noblar country, answered his summons, until an army of the like of which the world had never seen was assembled. So great was the ogre host, that the valleys squeaked and quaked as Grisus led the host north. Urk Ironskull had not been idle. More tyrants had fallen before him, as he penetrated deeply into the mountains of Morn. When word of the new Overtyrant and his coalition reached Urk, he planned to confront them at the place of his choosing. With his vast hordes surrounding him, Urk Ironskull assailed the fire mouth, driving off the strange, flame-breathing ogres that ruled there and planting his war trophies in the slopes of that smoking volcano. Urk knew that this was his chance to wrest control of the entire territory, and he planned to deliver the ogre's defeat while standing upon their living god, so that the brutes would know true fear. Urk Ironskull reckoned the simple bulrush tactics of the ogres would lead them straight into his trap, attacking up a steep slope against superior numbers. The ogre surge would bog down against the sea-like mass of goblins. Urk held little regard for the goblins' fighting ability, but their great quantity would slow down his foes, and buy time for the jaws of his trap to close. Massed orcs stood ready to close onto either ogre flank, while Urk unleashed his death blow, an assault by legions of armor-clad black orcs, who would charge downhill into the weary ogres. To amuse himself while he waited, Urk ordered his last prisoners thrown into the hissing lava pools of the volcano. Urk had correctly judged the hot anger of the ogres upon seeing the great fire mouth occupied by a mocking foe. Yet for all Urk's cunning, the war boss underestimated the iron rule of the overtyrant. 
Urk was used to fighting disparate ogre tribes, not a vast host fighting as a single army. After a forced march, the ogres entered the blackened valley, and in the early light of dawn they saw orcs and their trophies upon their volcanic deity, and each tyrant rushed to be the first to storm the slopes. No other ogre save Greasus Goldtooth could have halted that charge, and yet by bellowing orders that shook the valley, he managed to still the battle-hungry tribes. With a signal, Greasus called for the tyrants to gather for an impromptu war council. The pride of each tribe stepped forward, yet each leader was dwarfed beneath the colossal over-tyrant. Greasus recognized the trap that the Black Orcs had set. Yet he was not of a mind to back down. If Urk Ironskull wanted to charge down the Firemouth and surround the Ogres, then so much the better. It would save a lot of marching. Aiming to teach the Orcs not to bite off more than they could chew, Greasus told the assembled tyrants his battle plan. Several tyrants scratched their heads, but most grasped the brutal potential. Once the new formations were assembled, all were impressed with the over-tyrant's plan. The crux of Greasus's plan was for the great war-beasts and Mornfang cavalry that accompanied each tribe to be massed into a single wedge at the front of the battle line. As there were scores of different ogre tribes, the monstrous herd was quite large, containing stone horns, thunder tusks, and other beasts from that primordial land of ice and snow. Behind the formidable front rode a phalanx of Mornfang cavalry, followed by the rest of the ogres. Although Urk Einskull had prepared his minions for the ogre onrush, what surged up the volcano slopes was nothing like the greenskins had encountered before. The ground shook at their approach, and the unmissable rumblings of Firemouth were heard, the great volcano stirring as if in approval. The living wall of beasts stampeding towards them panicked the swathes of goblins, who at best loosed a few volleys of arrows before fleeing. Urk's plan of wearing down the ogre, Impetus, began to look shaky, but he still had hopes of his second wave, the large mobs of night goblins. As the monstrous herd churned up the mountain, dozens of mushroom-drugged loonies were launched out of the black-clad masses, each whirling a heavy iron ball. The shaggy beasts did not pause, stamping the fanatics underfoot and routing the night goblins utterly. Without breaking stride, the hulking creatures and gore-splattered Mornfang cavalry crashed into the Black Orcs beyond. Despite the onslaught, the Black Orcs held, although a third of their number were flattened in the charge. Using great axes, the Black Orcs chopped furiously, hacking out trunk-like legs so that some beasts stumbled back down the steep slopes, crushing a path through the oncoming ogres. Although they had halted the stampede and were destroying it, the Black Orcs were pinned in place and could not fulfil Urk's plan by joining the rest of the army as it closed on the onrushing ogres. Further down the slope, the jaws of the greenskin trap closed, the Orcs outnumbering the ogres by more than six to one. Had the Black Orc Centre been able to join the assault, then it may have been all over. As it was, the ogres were still hard-pressed. Amidst the fury of the great bloodletting, the Firemouth itself spoke, shaking the ground and sending thick plumes of smoke skyward. The midday sun was obscured behind falling ash, and the slopes were eerily lit by glowing streams of lava or the occasional flame gouts spouted by ogre firebellies priests of the Firemouth, who had eagerly joined Greasus for the fight. Despite the press of greenskins, the ogres dug in their heels and were starting to push back when the momentum shifted again. Having brought down the last of the great beasts near the summit, Urk and his Blackhawks at last joined the main fray. Their charge smashed into the ogres, and it was only the incomparable will of Greasus Goldtooth that held the ogres in place. The ogres gave ground, consolidating into a knot of resistance. The ogre centre remained rock-solid, for there Greasus fought himself, surrounded by his bodyguard of iron guts. The bedrock of the ogre line, Urk realised that to break the resistance, he must break its heart. 
The most hardened veterans on either side pounded at each other, giving all they could. Double-handed club strikes crumpled the Black Orcs, while the great choppers of the Greenskins cracked gut plates and were embedded deep in rotund bellies. It was here, in the slaughter-filled epicenter, that the battle would be decided, and both commanders knew it, for they personally pushed to the front, carving paths of carnage as they came. Around their leaders, the two armies fought like pairs of raging cave beasts, locking horns atop a mountain peak, and heaving with all their might. Disemboweled ogres strove to smash one last green skin even while their guts coiled from gaping wounds. Black orcs, their helmets caved in, and leaking brain matter fought to deliver one more axe blow. Greaser swung his diamond-studded scepter in sweeping arcs that smashed aside ranks of black orcs at a time. A grand uppercut from Greaser's club-like scepter caught Irk's personal banner-bearer, snapping his totem and sending the Black Orc flying upwards. It was a prodigious shot of heroic proportions, and for a moment the battered body seemed to hang in the air above the rim of the volcano before plummeting into the coiling smoke. Surviving ogres still talk of the distance and height of that majestic blow. Seeing Iron Skull's banner pole snapped, and its bearer sent skyward, the greenskin battle line wavered. Howling in rage, Urk sliced his way through a wall of iron guts to stand before Greasus in the slopes of the Firemouth. It was his battle to win, and no ogre was going to stop him. For the first time during the fight, a smile creased the many-jowled face of Greasus, as he bared his bullion teeth in his obese face. Laying down his colossal scepter, the over-tyrant grabbed at the Black Orc warboss. Urk's twin axes bit deep into his foe's meaty, obese, cholesterol-enhanced chest. But undaunted by his own free-flowing blood, Greaser snatched up his opponent with both hands, and squeezed and squeezed, and then squeezed some more. The sound of Urk's armor buckling and snapping under the massive pressure was audible, even over the cacophony of the battle. So too was the wet cracking that followed. For long minutes Greaser strained, until his bulging arms visibly shook at the effort. The crushed and twitching thing that the overtyrant finally dropped was unrecognizable, for Greaser had literally squeezed all the fluids out of the lifeless husk. The ogres cheered, their hoarse bellows answered by geysers of flame erupting from the volcano. The sight was too much for the remaining greenskins, who turned and fled. The ogres regrouped and as directed by the firebellies, gathered the slaughtered for a feast. And what a feast it was! Each and every ogre had to himself a heaped mound of green skin dead to devour. Greasus Gulltooth had, in one massive stroke, broken the war and made absolute mush of its leader. Under the smoky gaze of the volcano god, Greasus had cemented his title of overtyrant, for even those ogre tribes who were not at the battle were soon talking, of the great triumph and its monumental victory feast. At the end of the week-long celebration, as the firemouth vented molten anger into the sky, foretelling of yet greater battles to come, Greasus gave what to the ogres amounted as a long-winded speech. To the cheers of the assembled ogre kingdoms, Greasus bellowed, ah! Today the orcs, tomorrow the world! Let them all tremble! It was also after this battle when Bragg created the death-dealing weapon known as Great Gut Gouger that earned him true notoriety as Bragg the Gutsman. The weapon was cobbled together after he broke his scimitar and then fashioned a polearm from the broken blades of a slain orc warboss, and the magically glowing steel was beaten and reformed using the magma of the Firemouth itself. Thus was born a legend. But that's for another video. Thanks for watching. So